Good afternoon. Folks, I've traveled like 13 hours from the south of India, 13 hours one way, just to be in Edinburgh for two days, two working days. Uh, a little jet lag, been up since two this morning, right? So I could do with some help to help me stay awake and deliver this presentation. So good afternoon. <laughs> Lovely. All right. <laughs> Yes, I've come all the way from southern India, from Tamil Nadu, a, Tamil Nadu Chennai, where, yeah, yeah, yes, just, to, yeah, 13, 13 hours, yeah, so, such a joy to be here uh, in Scotland, I've been to the UK a few times before, and it's all been to London, um, love the history, uh, you know, when we were landing, it felt like I was, la we were landing into a postcard, right? And uh, the only other time I felt that was when we landed in Wellington in, in New Zealand. So uh, such a beautiful place, been walking around uh, the town, visiting a few places, ended up going all the way to the docks, right? Uh, where I come from a uh, seaside town in Chennai. And uh, Chennai is the first place where the British set up uh, the fort encampment, so the East India company when they came looking for you know good French clothes people. yeah yeah that is correct yeah the French also not not too far away anyway so um, got about 30 minutes and uh, my name is Kumar I've been with this company called manage engine for the past 15 years how many of you have heard of manage engine all right, quite a few. Okay, for those that haven't, uh, we are an IT management solutions company. We've been in the business for almost 25 years now, and uh, we offer IT management solutions end-to-end, uh, -end, everything under the sun, be it service management or operations management <coughs> or uh, active directory management, identity and access management, analytics, you name it, we have it, right? And I've been very fortunate to be part of this company. Uh, for the past 15 years, we did hear a lot about culture and all of that uh, this morning. And I can say that, uh, you know, as a company, we share very similar values. I've been married for 15 years now. I report to this. I've reported. I've been reporting to the same manager for the same 15 years now, right? <laughs> and yeah, both of them are different. And trust me, there's never been a dull day in the past 15 years, right? So. Uh, yeah, been in uh, the company for 15 years now. And yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking about future proofing the digital enterprise with a security for service management framework. See the marketing guys, they give these long winded titles. So um, I was thinking of a good opening. I was breaking my head. I couldn't get anything. But just before I went to bed last night, I was watching TV. And uh, there was this incident in Paris yesterday where a city employee uh, lost a briefcase containing laptop and a couple of USBs that supposedly contained plans for security plans for the Paris Olympics, right? How many of you are aware of that? Okay, so quite a few people, right, uh, are worried about uh, what's gonna happen next, but as usual, like every government does, you know, you know they said, oh, you know what? It, did not contain any security plans. You know, it was just a random computer lost with a couple of uh, USB drives. Maybe Inspector Cluzo after the, uh, uh, who's Inspector Cluzo? Anybody remember? Inspector Cluzo? Right, maybe he's on the job trying to track it down. But I have uh, a question to ask of you. Now, the employee has, is traveling, lost sensitive information, right? And, uh, it's stolen, it's gone. Now, who is bottom line responsible? I'm gonna ask three questions, right? I wanna show off hands. How many of you believe that the bottom line responsibility rests with the employee that lost the information? Okay. How many of you believe that the bottom line responsibility rests with the security operations team? All right, one person. How many of you believe that the responsibility actually lies with the team that manages assets in the company? Right? Employees tend to travel. Employees tend to lose things. 
That's human behavior, right? I've come all the way from Chennai. I have my laptop with me, right? But how many of you are IT asset managers? Or you, you sit in close periphery to asset management, right? Very simple stuff, right? It is, it is uh, you know, we've, we've moved to an age where the lines are blurring when it comes to responsibilities, especially after COVID, right? You cannot point fingers and say, oh, the employee was responsible. Oh, you know what? The security team is responsible. And then those guys say, okay, what were you doing without encrypting the laptop, right? That's a very valid question. If somebody comes and points fingers at your ITAM team and tells them, where the heavens were you when we asked you to encrypt this laptop? So that even, and where the heavens were you when we asked you to have a mechanism to remote wipe devices? How many of you can actually do that? Say confidently that you can do that today. Good, right? Okay, interestingly, that was one of the cases that I had. Anyway, uh, quick stats. I'm not going to waste time on these. Uh, because we all know cybersecurity is a major threat. Interestingly, one stat that uh, met my eye was, uh, you know, we're talking about digital transformation all the time, and this is now, you know, 50% of organizations think that any digital transformation initiative should have uh, steps towards cybersecurity, right? And how many of you have cyber insurance in your companies? All right, playing it safe, huh? And how many of you have, think, you know, they're rising by the day, right? It is, right? The conditions are getting stricter, right? And at the heart of it is asset management, right? If, if you do not comply to the list of regulations, you're not going to, you're going to pay very high premiums or not get insured at all. So why do we have to take all of these stats seriously? For far too long, right, ITSM, service management, and security operations have been seen as two different entities, have been seen as two different functions in the organizations, but post-COVID, with remote work in the past three or four years, right, that is beginning to blur. Those lines are beginning to blur, right? And the ITSM function needs to play an active role in strengthening the security posture of organizations. How many of you agree to this statement? that the ITSM organization, yes, right? Because there is no one person that can be held accountable for a random laptop con containing sensitive information uh, getting lost. All right, so at the end of this session, we will actually gain uh, a broad understanding. I'm gonna take you over seven cases, right? All of these happened. We, we've sourced it from multiple places, Reddit threads and all of that. So everyday ITSM, uh, processes, workflows that could have potential security flashpoints, okay? And what do we do, right, to address those security flashpoints and help strengthen the security posture of our organizations, all right? So case number one, we're going to look at seven cases, okay? Case number one, there is a user that uh, reports slowness in the machine, okay? What do we do? An end user comes to you, we, we kill the intensive processes, right? And we just give the laptop back to the user. Things worked fine, okay? A week later, the employee reported that uh, he couldn't he access, right? He was locked out, right? And it was probably the end of a holiday season or whatever, so there were quite a few uh, requests about account unlocks. So the IT service desk team went ahead unlock the employee's account, and things were BAU, business as usual. And then a few days later, the employee reports that some of the data in the laptop is stolen or encrypted. All right? So very seemingly unrelated incidents, right, culminating in a ransomware attack. Now what happened was, you know, there was a missing patch in the employee workstation, and an infiltrator was exploiting the patch, right? Trying to access, slow down, right? And as, as a result of which performance slowed down, as a result of which, you know, the user kept getting, uh, uh, you know, kicked out of the system. And, and we went ahead, just unlocked the account for them. And then what happened was in a few days, the ransomware is confirmed, 
right? So very quick question. How many of you during, uh, you know, the general process of incident diagnosis have patch compliance as a security check, as in the checklist? How many of you? I, I just want to see. Yeah, just put your fingers up well. Yeah, good. Okay, hands up well. Sorry. Four, four of you, right? And how many of you, when a user comes talking about, you know, requests for an account unlock, how many of you actually are able to have a process where you go to the Active Directory, either you query natively, that is your problem. How are you going to query natively with all the PowerShell thingy, right, is your problem. But there are tools that help you do that, interface between the Active Directory. And how many of you are able to go see the, uh, the details of the person, right, the, the domain controller or uh, the computer from which the, uh, the, uh, the, the user is reporting the issue from? and uh, the time, uh, the number of attempts before a simple unlock. How many of us are able to go quickly verify? It should not take a minute, more than a minute, for you to go do that. How many of us actually do that? Oh, able to, yes. Yeah, <laughs> able to. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just pushing everything on, on the positive <laughs> side of things. Okay, so the thing that I want to say here is, see, when you have incident diagnosis, right, keep these two or three things, very, very simple things, right? One is, you know, patch compliance data. Be able to refer to patch compliance data quickly. Be able to access your enterprise directory logs when it comes to account unlocks and all of that. So when you're able to do that, the other thing is, you know, when the employee came and said, oh, some of the files are missing, Right? That's the worst thing that can happen. An employee coming and a user coming and telling us that data is missing. Right? So quick question here. How many of us have some kind of file integrity management in place? Okay? On our end user laptops. At least the critical ones. This is important because when anybody tries to move the file, rename the file, or copy the file, right? There has to be some kind of a trigger. So a bunch of seemingly regular incidents can actually be a potential infiltrator, a potential threat to the company that needs to be addressed, right? The regular way of doing it is not gonna help you in the times to come, right? You would have to start thinking. I'm not saying, oh, you know what? Go shop for a data file integrity management software, go shop for uh, you know, uh, uh, patch monitoring software, go shop for an active directory. No, 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 no. But, you know, start thinking. Start thinking, oh my goodness. Okay, we do these things, we do it in these ways, but there can be so many loopholes, things that can go wrong, right? That is the thought I want to have, I want you to have from the session today. Finally, this is a little more advanced. How many of you have this uh, have heard of user and entity behavior analytics, right? Yuba. Okay, oh, <laughs> I know you're, you, you're in charge of cybersecurity, I guess. Yeah, so, so the classic front bencher in the security session, right? Putting the hand up for everything. But, right? So Yuba is, let's say I work at a hospital and I'm a doctor, so I'm an end user. I am supposed to access the systems between 9 and 4.30 uh, during the day. Let's say, uh, now, this is my baseline behavior, right? Now, I see that this system, a particular system accessed by a medical professional, is seeing repeated access attempts at 8.30, 9 in the evening, right? Is there a way for you to detect all that in your organization? How many of you say yes? Ah, still the minority, right? But if we do not, right, if we are not able to establish a baseline, if we are not able to identify the anomalies, right? We're putting ourselves at risk. Yuba is a huge topic. I'm not gonna go into it today, but start thinking along these lines, okay? Focus area one, treat patch compliance, user account logs, and data security monitors as basic, as basic when it comes to incident uh, diagnosis and investigation, all right? Second case, very quickly, employee onboarding and offboarding, can't be without consequences, obviously, right? So, uh, here's the example of a company that um, had operations all over the globe. 
worked with a lot of contractors. So there were people getting onboarded, offboarded every single day, right? And uh, how many of us have an automate? How many of us have a checklist in the first place for offboarding? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 don't put your hands down. How many of you have the checklist? Keep, keep your hands up. How many of you have an automated checklist to ensure that all of that is complete? Ha, huh. right? Good. So, uh, little things, right? So, um, so, this is in a different font. I'm not uh, uh, sure if you're able to see, but contractor one gets everything done, you know. Uh, for another contractor, there uh, was a slip up where the uh, asset was not collected back, right? And uh, the VPN access was not revoked. Now what happens is, um, there is a malware that gains access to this laptop, right? Gains access to the VPN and eventually starts moving laterally within the network. Very much possible. How many of you say this is possible? Once an employee is deprovisioned? Yes, it is possible. It's actually happened, right? Where, uh, I think this was in Florida, happened also in California, where uh, the employee was um, uh, deprovisioned, deprovisioned, and uh, there was a threat actor that gained access, increased uh, the levels of a particular chemical uh, in the water by about 5,000 times. Okay, luckily somebody noticed it. Otherwise, you know, the town of Florida would have been, sorry, not the, 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 not the town of Florida, a town in Florida uh, would have been fallen very sick, right? So this is possible. And I know of a supermarket chain that had its uh, uh, whole network access uh, uh, infiltrated because they, they, there was this high voltage air conditioning contractor uh, that was uh, that had privileged access to a few resources and when this contractor left the company they forgot to uh, lower the privileges back again right how many of you have even a mechanism to manage privileges in your organization wow <laughs> wonderful wonderful so the question is now how many of you have a mechanism to manage privileges yes put your hands up again Right, remember you need to keep me awake, right? Take the trouble. How many of you have tied this to your offboarding process? Privilege management and offboarding process. Wonderful, right? Good. So, what happens is very simple. When an employee is offboarded, all we need to do is just transfer the passwords, accounts, privileges to a different privilege user. One, right? We'll need to revoke access to these resources passwords, accounts for this uh, employee that's going to be deprovisioned. Finally, we got to rotate the passwords, right? Off, you know, remove them from the user groups and all of that. Finally, if there were any shared passwords, the, or any shared resources, right? On the, the, the you know, with, to, with the deprovisioned contractor or employee, right? We would need to rotate the passwords. How many of you actually do this as part of your offboarding and keep it automated? Mm. Okay, just about three or four of us. Okay, so very simply, when you start looking at a security first offboarding experience, right? <coughs> I would recommend that you envelop it, right? in the principles of privilege access management, which means, you know, you revoke the privileges that we spoke about, you clean up the standing privileges, you know uh, who is, you know, authorized to access what, you audit that every now and then, you see, you know, if privileges need to be uh, lowered, if privileges need to be revoked, if privileges need to be escalated, right? So you got to keep uh, have an accountability of active privileges and then you know you go ahead and delete the user okay so the next time you offboard an employee right think if you are doing it through privilege access management if not we are putting ourselves at risk okay yeah so entrench privilege access management with your service management workflows not only for offboarding but how many of you do it for change how many of you do it for change? Okay, not too many people. We're gonna come to that next. Okay, so when it comes to change, right, we try to take one step forward and end up taking two steps backward. So here's the 
uh, story of two organizations that went through a merger. Okay, and their security stacks needed to be reconciled. So they needed to be merged. And um, what happened is, you know, the two database systems need to be merged. So they go ahead, the change is done, they, they take a backup. So the backup file of one of the companies has a lot of sensitive uh, trial data because this is a pharma company, uh, very classified trial data. And what happens is the change is done, the, uh, the, the writing is stopped and, and the file is restored and life you know, continues. Now what happens is sometime later, a month later, right, the backup file is released to the darknet. Okay, how many of you think this is possible? Very much possible, right? So, what do we do with our changes? Okay, very simply, the straightforward way, oh, I raise a change request, I consult the cab, I add the members, I add task owners, implementation owners, we all do that. How many of us do that? Yeah, 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 that's our job, we do that. No, no, no questions about all that, right? But at the end of the day, right, this is the unsecure way of doing changes. And the secure way of doing changes is all about doing three things, getting three things right, okay? You again envelop your change, you cover your change with privilege session monitoring, okay? You cover your change with access provisioning system and a file integrity management system. So the whole thing, now zero trust can mean a lot of things, okay? Every damn vendor like us under the sun talks zero trust, right? Everybody, right? You go to InfoSec in London sometime in April or May, you, you'll have zero trust staring at you from every corner, right? It's, <laughs> right? But when it comes to actually applying zero trust to our everyday service management operations, it's all about the basics, right? What are the basics? So zero trust is about, you know, giving role-based access, right? Not everybody goes, takes a database backup, keeps it, is able to access the database backup and do what they want with it. So the first thing is about access control, right? And then, <coughs> sorry, the next thing is about auditing, right? What people are doing. So when it comes to implementing the change, when they up, so when the backup was taken, the first thing that they needed to do was put it under a, file integrity management system, right? Anybody goes anywhere near the backup, you need to have the alarms go off. How many of you keep critical database backups under file integrity management during the change process? Good, right? One, two, how many of us have an access provisioning system where, you know, the zero trust principle says, give the user the minimum privileges required to do the job, right? Now this, this statement you know, shines bright in, in every documentation that you see. It's nothing, man. It's, it's, it's just about you know, letting the few people right, that can do the job with the limited amount of privileges for them to go take a backup and then continue the change. Right? It is all about how many of you, as part of access management systems, use command filtering and command control? Right? Where you just don't give, okay, oh, you know what? This person is allowed to perform this change, so let him go in, do whatever he wants. No, 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 that is not possible. How would it be where I can give that user the permission to execute exactly the four or five commands needed to get the change done? How many of us do that? Command filtering and command control, right? Sometimes, maybe, maybe not, right? All of this is what is zero trust, right? So you don't have to think zero trust as some, you know, big thing, big mandate from, from, from the heavens, right? Oh, what is zero trust? Zero trust is so many things. I don't know if I'm compliant with zero. No, 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 no. Zero trust is common sense, like every other technology you know, understanding is, right? It's just common sense. So cover your change management in zero trust. The third aspect is when the change is taking place, when the database backup is taking place, when the restore is taking place, how many of us record the session? How many of us do that? Right? So, how many of us think recording the session would be useful for audits later? I am telling you, we, this is exactly what the cyber insurance 
insurance companies want from you. You do all these things, right? Your premiums will be low. You don't do these things, right? You're either going to invest in processes, in tools and mechanisms to get stuff done the right way, or you end up paying the money as insurance. Agreed? Or worse, right? You end up paying the money to somebody else, right? You don't invest it on yourself. You don't invest it in insurance, right? Some guy in the dark web would come, take the money and go, right? Sorry to be so blunt, but that's the truth, right? So that's about change. So weave in zero trust principles where possible, particularly in change management. Okay, now the fourth is IT asset management. I know we spoke quite a bit before, right? So example of a company which suffered two minor breaches over uh, the course of 12 months. One is they had uh, an unauthorized endpoint accessing the network. The other was a phishing attempt, okay? So the company hires a, a CISO and uh, the person goes about trying to get the company up to uh, level with the SOC norms. And as part of which they look at CIAs and NIST standards. And uh, very quickly, right? This is the ITIL way of doing asset management, right? Okay, asset classification, asset inventory, you scan, you bring stuff inside, you audit, da, 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 da. software asset management, hardware asset management, yeah, we know that. All of us know that, right? But how do we make that more secure? How many of us today have a mechanism to identify unknown or rogue devices in the network? Right? Yeah, maybe about 30, 30, 30 35 right? So how, you know, if, if we had a mechanism to just be alerted, right, of devices in the guest mode that stay beyond the time, of unauthorized devices accessing the network, if, you know, if we had information on the ports, we could shut that down, right? We could do a lot of things. So that is number one. Okay, I'm not even going to talk about access privilege and all of that, right? We've spoken enough about all of that, right? So how many of us, you know, keep, keep an inventory of, uh, you know, use software metering, what software is used the most, used the least, right? So because a lot of these infiltration attempts happen through this, through the, the very sparingly used software, not, not through the ones that are patched and all of that, right? Endpoint device and data control. This is important, right? As part of our asset management, how many of us actually have complete control over our endpoints so that if they're lost, if they're misplaced, whatever, I would have the power to remote wipe, I would have the power to do a corporate wipe, selective wipe, factory reset, reset passwords, generate recovery keys. How many of us can do that? Good. I hope the city of Paris can do that. Right? Otherwise, I think it's left to inspect a Clouseau, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, if the guy is lucky, he'll find the diamond. So, <laughs> and of course, encryption status of how many of you have a policy where if your employee travels, you encrypt the laptop no matter what? The rest of us, right, are in trouble, even within the corporate network, right? So every time we have a travel policy where every time, you know, the hotel, the flight needs to be, the visa uh, needs to be uh, uh, approved. Yeah, the visas approved, check. After that tickets, check. After that hotels, check. And then the mail comes from IT, right? Would you please report to the pit stop for us to check if your laptop is encrypted, right? I get that mail a dozen times a year because I keep traveling a lot, right? I say, hey guys, you've done it already. Don't worry about it, right? Otherwise I will be in the news, right? <laughs> Anyway, so just some thoughts. So, okay, so complement ITAM practices to uh, bridge the GRC, which is the governance risk and compliance gap. Okay, next case number five is uh, CMDB. How many of you have a CMDB? Okay, how many of you have a CMDB that is updated from different sources real time? Mm. Okay, so. Uh, 
Again, a question of a company that suffered a breach in the data centers. All services except the email service goes down. Now what happens is they consult the CMDB, they see the relationships, okay, everything looks okay, but the CMDB had relationships only between the infrastructure components, not the services mapped to it. Apparently the email service was also mapped to another data center, so the team did not have visibility of that. They should have upgraded the firewall rules of the secondary data center also, now that the first one is compromised, right? They did not do that. A week later, the other set, data center also gets hacked, okay? So very quickly, start thinking about setting up a CMDB. Don't keep the relationships manual, right? Have the relationships sourced from different sources like ITOM software because you need to have the privileges of CIs accessing other critical CIs. You need to have patch compliance data. You need to have, uh, you know, the uh, layer two devices and all of that mapped inside your CMDB. Because this is, the, the robust CMDB is the primary input to any SIEM initiative in your organization, right? Without that, we are sitting ducks, okay? Pillar number five, keep the CMDB as the foundation to support cybersecurity initiatives. Finally, how many of you manage SSL certificates in your organization. Mm. No, 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 don't put your hands down, okay? How many of you continue to manage it manually? Manually, ah. Yeah, you know, all this was good a few years ago when the life of certificates was five years. All this was okay a few years ago when the life cycle of certificates was brought down from five to two years. All this was probably okay when the life cycle, the life of a certificate was brought down to 398 days, okay? I have good news and I have bad news, okay? The good news is you're going to be automating your certificate life cycle management very, very soon. You know why? As we speak, the most important browsers in the world are contemplating a 90-day life cycle of certificates. <laughs> good luck with that. How many of you like the good news? How many of you like the bad news? <laughs> you don't have a choice. You like it, you don't like it, it's going to be brought down to 90 days. And I'm telling you, the CLM vendors are preparing big time. Right? It could be our GST moment or whatever moment, right? But how many of you manage over... 500 certificates, not too many? Okay, 400, over 100 certificates? Yeah, over 100 certificates, right? How many of you are happy to do it manually? No, 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 you cannot, right? So, classic case of a company that had an outage, uh, took a while for them to figure out where the, uh, that it was a certificate issue, right? And I'm telling you in 2024, in this day and age, right? We would be keeping company with King Arthur and uh, his knights if we're still doing this manually, right? We cannot afford to do this manually anymore because the regime is now down to 90 days, right? And every 90 days you keep doing this manually, that's the only thing you'll be doing, right? So, um, happened and uh, would recommend that you start thinking of an automated CLM process inside your service management framework, okay? This is very important because I don't have to explain the vulnerabilities. Two minutes, sorry. Can you wait for two minutes? Is it okay? Lovely, right? So if we are not going to give importance to this, if you're not going to make this part of our mainstream service management framework where you just, you know, when a certificate is about to expire, the, the system automatically generates a request, gives it to the CA, the CA verifies it, and then sends the certificate back to you, then your system checks the validity of the certificate, automatically applies it, and restarts, you know, whatever services. You know, that's actually happening, right? We don't do it. Right? We're going to be caught. After, when this 90-day regime comes in, right, wait for the exploits that are going to happen. Right? So if there's one very, very low-hanging fruit that you, know, you could get out of this session, you know, start thinking about this. Okay? So pillar number six, automate certificate lifecycle management end-to-end. -end. 
Otherwise, yeah, be prepared to face the downtime and potential attacks. Finally, right, this is a case we've already discussed. Interestingly, I had this case. I presented this in a, as a webinar uh, two weeks ago, and we had this case, and now, you know, this is uh, uh, the, the Paris uh, episode. Uh, brings this back into focus. So there was this healthcare organization, uh, VP of Finance, that was traveling, had the, um, the laptop stolen, and uh, the uh, disability details of about 26 million veterans was leaked, okay? And the company had to pay uh, fines in the ranges of 300 to 500 million dollars, okay? This was in the US, right? Okay, if, if we can pay such fines, right? No problem, don't, don't, don't worry about all of this, right? But if not, start thinking about geofencing. Start thinking about having a policy to safeguard temporary asset requests, okay? How many of us have an asset loan policy where somebody travels, we give them a temporary asset that doesn't contain critical information? How many of us actually have that? Okay, one person. If not, what are the options? Right? Just go in for encryption, just go in for geofencing. How many of us have some kind of geofencing? Right? Where when the device leaves the corporate network, a bunch of policies come into play. And when those policies are violated, right, the alarm is triggered to the owner of the device, to the IT admin. We take actions like blocking the ports or you know, uh, locking the device, remote wipe, corporate wipe, whatever. Right? How many of us have that at all, right? This is a big risk, this is a big risk, okay? Because forget employees traveling, we're talking about people that are sitting at home and working, we talk, talk about hybrid work, nobody's in the mood to get back to office, right? I go to office three days a week and I find it like climbing a mountain, my kids are shocked. Do you have to go to office today? I have to remind them that there was once a time when I used to go to office five days a week. How many of you are in that situation? Right? Yeah, so this is something that you would need to start taking up on priority, geofencing tasks, you know, take up uh, data encryption, uh, password rotation, browser security, right? At your endpoints in your laptops, right? All of these, right? And have, you know, the, uh, uh, the control over your uh, devices. Anyway, so that brings us to pillar seven, geofence any temporary asset request. So seven focus areas that we've seen, right? Treat patch compliance, user account logs, uh, file integrity ma monitors as basic, uh, entrench spam within your service management workflows. When you do change, and not only change, other things, weave in zero trust principles where possible, complement ITAM practices, you know, to strengthen your GRC compliance norms, and uh, keep the CMDB as the foundation to support your cybersecurity initiatives, automate certificate lifecycle end-to-end. If there is anything you take away from today because the deadline is approaching very fast, the announcement is going to come very soon, right? And finally, geofence any temporary asset request. And because the company paid so much to fly me from Chennai all the way and you know host me in this nice city, I need to do the honors. We have a nice uh, service management uh, tool called Service Test Plus, been in the market for about 20 years. Right? And we have a whole lot of you know, uh, applications uh, that cover every use case, every need that we spoke about in the last 30 minutes. So, and these talk to our service management software. So anytime you want, just go ahead and uh, log into our website so you would be able to see that information. With that, I must thank you all for your time, uh, for the extra five minutes that you've spent with me today. I hope the session was useful. Thank you very much. <laughs>